church, we're live once again. Happy Easter. He has risen. And I'm going to answer for you. He has risen indeed. We're so glad that you all are able to join us this morning. And we're so thankful what the Lord did for us by dying on the cross and rising again. We're going to start our service a little differently. I'm going to sing a special number this morning that just, I think, fits our Easter service very well. So please worship with me as I sing.
Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is alive. And uh, I heard an interesting thing the other day that uh, the stone was rolled away not so Jesus could get out because he could go in and out of rooms at will, but so that we could get in, so that we could see that he had risen. Uh, welcome. And I'm going to give you a phone number again. If you have something to write down, write down 970 um, 497. 4925. That'll get you to the church. That'll get you to the elders if you have any needs, uh, any desires, that uh, questions that might come up from uh, anything you hear today or just questions in general. We're happy to visit with you. And again, that's 970 497 4925. And uh, you can email us also at Celebration Montrose at gmail.com celebrationmontrose at email.com and uh, at gmail.com and that's also our website uh, website celebrationmontrose.org so uh, if you want to give you can give online at celebrationmontrose.org for those of you who are trying to figure out how you can do it that's, that's one way to get it uh, to us uh, I'd like to challenge you that during this time, we, uh, we have an opportunity that we've never had before. People want to know how to have hope, joy, peace, and we have the answer. I'd like to challenge you to call someone you know and just... Ask them, you know, do you have hope? Do you have peace? Do you have joy? Uh, I'd, I'd love to share with you how I have this. And uh, so be ready to, to go there to share what you know. And we're going to go into a prayer time right now, and I'm going to start off on this same subject, that as we go to prayer, ask God to show you someone that you can be praying for. And along with that, ask God to uh, give you the words and the courage to go forward and share. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Just praise God for what he did in, in coming to earth, dying for us, taking our sins, and uh, being raised again to new life. And uh, ask the Lord to help us and, and other churches and, and uh, other people who uh, know Him to again use this time. Don't let it get by. Uh, spend time. Ask God to show you where to go in His Word uh, to, to get to know Him better. Father, help us to be diligent, to get into your word, to get to know you better. You gave us this whole Bible to allow us to know who you are and how we can have fellowship with you. Uh, help us to, again, to be diligent in this, to, to get to know who you are, you wrote us a love letter 
help us to look at it as such and just desire it more and more every day. Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory for, for everything that you are, what you've done, uh, that you cared enough for each one of us, that you desire us to be in relationship with you. We just thank you for these things. Uh, we ask that you go before us in, in our time of worship, in song, and in word, and uh, just be with each person who is, is here, uh, coming before you in this. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And then uh, Dr. Charles Boswell will be with us again, and uh, we sure appreciate all he's doing. Uh, I'm going to read right now from uh, John 20, verses 1 through 9. Again, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb, while it was still dark, and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and, he, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb, and the two were running together. And the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter, and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter therefore also came, following him, and entered the tomb, and he beheld the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then entered in therefore the other disciple also, who had come first to the tomb, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must again, uh, he must rise again from the dead. Praise God. So Friday was a day of sadness. Saturday was a day of silence. And Sunday is a day for celebration. And I think that's pretty fitting that we're a celebration church. So I want you guys, as you're worshiping with us, to remember He is risen, and that's something to celebrate.
And again, he died on the cross, but he did not stay dead. And as I love to tell our kiddos in children's church, hi kids, I miss you. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a fable. This is not a story. This really happened. Jesus really died on the cross for our sins, and he really rose from the dead, and he's really coming back soon to get us. So again, worship with us.
guys good do I look good you look good yeah Gary well that wasn't Gary was it he was the other liar anyway 
Good morning. Uh, we are live from Celebration Church here in Montrose, Colorado. Some of you may not know where we are, but we're in the southwest, uh, sort of a southwest center part of Colorado down here in this beautiful valley. And Celebration is a wonderful church. It was the first church that I had the privilege of uh, preaching in uh, when I first moved from Emmanuel Baptist Church in the new position that I hold as uh, Director of Pastor Care and Church Health, and it's always a delight to be here. Normally, this auditorium that holds several hundred uh, is full, and we are abiding by the government's uh, request. There are 10 people, no more than 10 here, and uh, two have just left, so now they're down to eight, and I think uh, one more is leaving, so we'll be down to seven. So uh, now that I'm getting up to... Uh, uh, to uh, preach from God's word, we have the musicians leaving, but you know, it's typical musicians. Just kidding, guys, so just kidding. Love you too, man. They're going to go home and watch it with their families, and I don't blame them. And I hope you're at home watching with your family too, and it's a delight to be here once again. Take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, and we're going to begin our study today, The Resurrection by Believing You May Have Life, and Believing in the Resurrection of Jesus, in fact, in fact, gives us life, not only eternal life, but abundant life. So John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. But before we look at the scripture this morning, I want to uh, kind of give us uh, something a little bit funny. I know it's hard sometimes in these difficult times to laugh, but we need to do that from time to time. And I hope you have a sense of humor. And if you have a neighbor next to you, look at him and say, I hope you have a sense of humor. So we're going to try some humor this morning uh, via this live uh, uh, telecast, broadcast. So uh, uh, there was a uh, um, spring break coming up, and little Joey uh, wanted to see his grandparents. They lived a pretty good distance away. Mom and Dad could not leave work. And so as a result of that, they decided they would send Joey to Grandma and Grandpa on the bus. And uh, so they did. Bought him a ticket, took him to the bus station, found his place on the bus, sat him next to the window. And uh, before the parents could leave, lo and behold, an elderly gentleman much older than Drew, who is our, one of our technicians, uh, uh, came and sat beside the young man. And uh, the parents introduced the elderly gentleman to the young boy, and everything seemed to be fine. They felt pretty good about it, and they got off the bus and waved goodbye to Joey through the window as the bus drove off. And the elderly gentleman was thinking as the, uh, as the trip began how difficult it was going to be to find any peace because he's sitting next to a young boy. You know, they, they stir, stir around, they, they're fidgety, they're going to get up, they're going to make a lot of trouble for this elderly gentleman who just wanted a peaceful ride uh, to his destination. But lo and behold, after about 35, 40 minutes, the young boy was not moving, he was not fidgeting, he was not doing anything. He was very quiet, very still, and as a matter of fact, it made the elderly gentleman kind of feel like a little bit bad about what he thought about the young man and he noticed that what was keeping this young man's attention whatever it was was a good thing and he noticed that he was reading something in his lap couldn't quite tell what it was so he finally decided he'd interrupt the young man from his quiet disposition and said young man can I ask you a question he said yes mister you may he said what is it that you're reading that's creating such a uh, uh, you know this moment of quiet and stillness what are you reading with such rap fascination the young man said, well, I'm reading from the Bible, sir. He said, well, young man, what is it that you're reading from the Bible that is so fascinating that's caused you to sit so still? He said, well, I'm reading from the Gospel of John where Jesus was crucified. He was buried, but he rose from the dead. He rose from the grave, and he's alive. And the elderly gentleman thought for a moment, looked to the young man, and he said, young man, you don't believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead, do you? He said, yes, mister. As a matter of fact, I do. The elder gentleman asked him then, so well, how do you know that Jesus rose from the dead? The young boy looked at him, kind of surprised, and said, well, sir, he said it's recorded right here in the Gospel of John. As a matter of fact, it's recorded in Matthew, it's recorded in Luke, it's uh, recorded in Mark, and it's also recorded in the Gospel of John that I'm reading today. And uh, the elder, elderly gentleman thought for a moment, looked at the little boy, and said, well, how do you know that's true, young man, just because it's recorded there? He said, well, when I get to heaven, sir, I'm going to look John up, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I'm going to ask them, and sure enough, they're going to tell me that exactly what happened was recorded in their gospel, and it did happen just as they recorded in their gospels. The elderly gentleman looked at the young man and said, well, young man, what if they're not in heaven? The little boy without batting an eye looked at the elderly gentleman and said, well, then, mister, you can ask him. 
<laughs> you see, uh, the resurrection is an important fact. It's an important aspect for those of us who are Christians. For believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only imperative, it's important. And part of that gospel is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. For the gospel according to Paul in the book of Romans said that we cannot, we cannot be saved unless we believe that Jesus in fact rose from the dead. Now the fact of the matter is that there are many people today who have a problem with Jesus having been raised from the dead. The fact that someone who died could physically rise from the dead, could rise from the grave. And it's not unusual for people to doubt that because as we see in the text this morning that we're going to be reading together in John chapter 20 beginning with verse 19, even the disciples of Jesus had a problem with believing the fact, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. Even when Christ took the time before he died and before he rose from the dead to tell his disciples that in fact he was going to die and rise from the dead, they still did not understand, they still not, did not believe. And so recorded for us in this very transparent text in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19, we see the disciples in their doubt. We're also going to look at a, at a man named Thomas, who was a doubter. That's how we call him, Thomas the Doubter. But the reality is, I think that's an unfair title for Thomas, because the reality is that every one of Christ's disciples, in fact, doubted the fact that he would rise from the dead. And even after reports that he had risen from the dead, they still questioned and they still wondered about it. So if you're having questions and doubts and concerns and, and misunderstandings about the resurrection of Jesus, it's understandable because even recorded in the Gospel of John we're going to read today, we're going to see how the disciples in their struggle found this beautiful truth about the reality of the resurrection of Christ and the life-changing difference it brought in their lives. And I hope that as you discover today the truth about the reality of the resurrection, that you, like them, will see the life-changing transformational truth of how the resurrected Christ will make a difference in your life. In verse 19, we see that in the disciples' life, there was a life-changing discovery that took place. Chapter 20, verse 19. Notice what it says. And on the evening of that day, the first day of the week. Here we see that on the first day, the first evening of that day, this is Sunday during the day. Uh, we all know that, as a matter of fact, that the reason why we worship as Christians on Sunday is because we believe that Christ rose from the tomb, he rose from the grave on Sunday morning. I don't know if the children that are with you today understand that that's the reason why we as Christians worship on Sunday morning, because we believe that every Sunday morning should be Easter Sunday morning. That's why we worship on Sunday morning, the first day of the week. Well, Christ had, in fact, risen from the dead on the first day of the week. We know that because in the passage that uh, our elder David read just a little while ago, that uh, Mary went to the tomb. And while she went to the tomb, she was surprised that the tomb was empty. And she, as a matter of fact, she concluded falsely that someone had stolen the body of Christ, ran to where the disciples were in hiding, and told them that someone had, in fact, stolen Christ's body. Well, there was a foot race then to the tomb between Simon, Peter, and John. And when they arrived, John arrived first. He stood at the front entrance of the tomb. Peter burst through the front entrance, pushed John aside. Then together they went and examined the tomb. And sure enough, it was empty. They did not see Christ. But they noticed the linen that was there and realized and concluded that, in fact, Christ was not there. They did not know why. And I'm sure from there they went back to where they were in their hiding place with the doors locked. And Mary, the Bible says, stood behind, stayed behind. And the Bible says that she was weeping profusely until all of a sudden someone she thought was a gardener appeared. But, in fact, it was Jesus. She did not recognize him, possibly because she couldn't wipe away the tears that, she was, that were falling from her cheeks. And it wasn't until he called her name Mary that she finally realized it was Jesus. No one could say her name like Christ. And in that beautiful encounter, he tells Mary to go and tell the disciples that in fact, his body had not been stolen, that he had actually risen from the dead. And she does that. She goes to the hiding place and tells the disciples that Christ had in fact risen from the dead, but he had not. According to them, they didn't understand it, didn't believe it, didn't see it. And they lacked understanding, didn't believe Mary, and yet remained in hiding. We know later that day, at some point, Jesus appeared to two guys walking on the road to Emmaus. And I'm sure after that encounter with Christ, they more than likely told the disciples that they had seen Jesus as well. We know that Simon Peter later on had his own personal encounter with Christ. 
So there were several encounters that people had had with the living Lord Jesus Christ at the disciples. We find them in this text. Notice it says the doors being locked were where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. They had locked their doors in a hiding place for fear of the Jews. I think that's pretty transparent on John's part. They're afraid the Jews are going to capture them as they did Christ, try them, and then crucify them. They're afraid that they are going to be next. They've eliminated their Messiah, their Master, their Savior, their Jesus, and now more than likely they're the next victims of this plot to eliminate this a beautiful gospel that they had been given to proclaim. And so they were in fear and they had the doors locked. And, and it's interesting to me that these disciples believed that somehow, somehow, locked doors were going to keep the Romans or the, the temple guards from busting down the door and arresting them and doing the same thing that, uh, that they did to Christ. You know, I think this is somewhat of a false sense of security. Believing that they can do something to protect themselves when in reality their faith should and their trust should be placed in God. You know, in COVID-19 we've been asked to do a lot of things and we should do the things that we are asked to do to protect ourselves and protect those that we love. But all of our measures of self-protection are not going to keep us safe just by themselves. Our trust should be placed in God, in Jehovah. For he and he alone is the one who is sovereign and in control of not only our present, but our future. And these disciples certainly should have trusted the Lord instead of trusting their own measures to protect themselves. But in this false sense of security, they locked the doors and believed themselves to be safe. And then notice, all of a sudden, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. It says in verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Even with the doors locked, there's this supernatural uh, presence, this appearance of Christ, who all of a sudden appears out of nowhere. Obviously, he didn't walk through the door. He didn't walk through the window. Uh, the doors were locked. They were sealed. They were in a place of hiding. Christ not only knew where they were, but he supernaturally superimposed his presence among them in the room. Notice, he stood among them. And as I looked at that, I just sort of scratched my head, and I wonder, how long did he stand there among the disciples, not under the table or not in a corner or not in some other room, but he stood among them, not being recognized that he was even there. He stood there for, what, a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes, who knows, but he stood among them. They didn't recognize him, they did not see him, he stood among them, and all of a sudden he broke silence by speaking to them a very common, very courteous uh, greeting that was very common during the day of Jesus, peace be with you. But I think Jesus was just doing more than just making a courtesy welcome. He was bringing the excitement down by reminding them of the peace that his presence brings in the midst of our chaos and our tragedy. I mean, if you can imagine the disciples in that upper room with their doors locked and all of the things that were going on and the concerns and the questions and the debates and the discussions and all of those things, Christ appears all of a sudden unannounced and he addresses them by saying, peace be with you. Be at peace. Don't be troubled. Don't be worried. Don't be stressed. But be at peace. Verse 20. And when he, Jesus, had said this, he then showed them his hands and his side. Notice the passage, though. Then, after seeing, notice the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I can imagine how astonished, how stunned they were when all of a sudden Christ appears and he speaks, peace be with you. They were somewhat taken back by that. And all of a sudden he then reveals himself as the one who they had left everything to follow, the one that had been arrested, the one had been crucified, and now by the evidence that he is showing them, he is revealing himself as the resurrected Messiah, the Savior, the Jehovah. He now has been raised from the dead, and it wasn't until they saw those marks from the crucifixion, it wasn't until they saw that they rejoiced, that they were glad. Now this isn't what I might call a a Presbyterian or a, 
a Baptist display of joy in a place of worship that someone is a little bit subdued and a, you know if you tap your feet you're a little you're you're suspect. You know what I'm talking about, Matt? He's one of our technicians in the back. He's laughing back there, helping me out. I appreciate it. And uh, I think it was more of a Pentecostal, Baptistical thing. I mean, these guys started dancing and singing and jubilant, filled with joy. They're rejoicing because their Messiah, their Savior, their Jesus, who they thought had been crucified and had been placed in a tomb and was dead, is now alive. He's not dead, he's alive. And how rejoicing and how jubilant, how exciting and how wonderful things all of a sudden went from doom and gloom to excitement to, to the name of this church, celebration. Because Christ is not dead, he is alive. And the disciples' faith at this moment that was dying, distant, is now revived, it's renewed, it's restored. And their faith in Jesus is now what it once was, even not just what it once was, but even more than what it once was, because Jesus now again is in their presence. And they're excited. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, I think Jesus sort of says, all right, boys, we've had enough celebration. Let's get Baptist now. Let's bring it down. Let's calm it down. I've got a word for you. You know, uh, we've had enough singing and celebration. So now let me get the word to you. He says again, peace be with you. He repeats himself again with the same greeting. And I think it's kind of a, a good thing because Christ is about to give them uh, a commission, about to remind them, about to restore their calling. And he knows that in giving them this admonition that it may create a little bit of apprehension, a little bit of fear. So he's saying, and he's reminding them, remember in John chapter 14, when I, when, he's, when I said to you, gentlemen, when I said to you, my disciples, my peace I give unto you, not as the world I give to you, but I give you a different peace, and I'm going to send you a comforter, and he's going to be with you and give you the peace and the joy you're going to have, even in the midst of tribulation and hardship and difficulty as you fulfill your assignment. So he says, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Christ came because he was sent by the Father, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, to be sent by the Father to perform the, uh, the ministries, uh, to be on the mission that he was on from the beginning to the end. As we saw last week, he was headed to the cross, to the message of the gospel and believing in him as Savior and Lord of their lives by which they could be saved, to the beautiful miracles and ministries that he did. All of that he did because the Father sent him. And now he's saying to disciples, as I was sent, I am sending you. Where are they? They're in a locked room. The doors and the windows locked in a hideout. And he's saying to them, boys, I want you to leave this locked hideout and go out into the city streets and boldly proclaim the gospel that you have come to believe in. That I'm not dead, that I'm alive. And I think it's a beautiful testimony of what's going on during COVID-19 for many churches who have kept the gospel of Christ in the four walls of the church and many churches today had their doors locked from the outside, keeping people from the outside from coming in, mostly by programs and other things. They were not really concerned mostly about their community. have all of a sudden been driven by this COVID-19 that has forced the gospel out of the locked doors of our churches and into the, to the, to the internet where more pastors and more gospels being preached today live and recorded on the internet than ever before. And I think what a beautiful manifestation of that for us today as we sort of think about that application to take it outside the walls of the church and the city streets, this beautiful message that Christ is not dead, he is risen, and the gospel that we've been called to proclaim. And in order to, to encourage them, to remind them of their purpose, notice it says in verse 40, uh, 22, he said, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. It's interesting here that, that Jesus now understands that in order for them to, to leave their hideout and to unlock their doors and to take this message into the city streets, they're going to have to do it not only not in their power, but in a supernatural power. And this is the paraclete, this is a, 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 a precursor to what is about to happen in the book of Acts. It's not uncommon for many in the Old Testament to be filled and anointed with the Spirit for a special dispensation, for a special call, for a special ministry, for a special time. 
Uh, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Christ operated and moved and ministered and did the miracles he did through the, through the Spirit of God. And so Christ knows that in order for his disciples to have the, the bravery and to be equipped and empowered and encouraged to be able to leave uh, the locked doors and go out into the city streets, they're going to need a supernatural power of the Spirit of God to enable them to overcome their fears and, and to operate in faith and go forth. And so he... He breathes on them and he says, receive this special dispensation, this paraclete of the Holy Spirit prior to Acts when he falls on the whole crowd that's in the upper room. So that you might in these next 40 days uh, consume and, and apply and learn all that I want to instruct and all that I want to reveal to you. Then in verse 23, for if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. It sounds like that the disciples are given a, a special power to be able to forgive sins and not forgive sins, but that's not really what Jesus is saying here. He's reminding them of the proclamation of the gospel that they will be proclaiming. They will be preaching. They will be declaring to the world because it's through the gospel of Christ, through our faith in not only his work on the cross, but his resurrection from the dead that we have the forgiveness, the remission, the cleansing of our sin. And those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Christ have our sins forgiven. And those who reject Christ do not have our sins forgiven. And so here he is restoring to these disciples their calling as he renews their faith. It's a life-changing discovery. A life-changing discovery. And their lives will never be the same. And I hope you've made that discovery as well. Because if you will, if you did, your life will never be the same. We see in verse 24 then a life-changing declaration that's made. Because there is one disciple that's not present. Notice in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. You know, what a disappointment. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, why Thomas was not present. We're not told why. But Thomas was not there. Now put yourself in Thomas's sandals for a moment. Obviously he didn't wear shoes or boots, so let's pretend that we're in his sandals today. And if you were Thomas and you were maybe on an errand or you went to see your mom or maybe you just went out for a breath of, breath of fresh air because there's so many people in the upper, you know, in this room, in this hideout, you just need to, and, and all of a sudden you, you come back in the room and you discover I've missed the most important moment of my life because notice what it says in verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. I mean, Thomas comes into the room and how long do you think it took for the disciples to tell Thomas, who was not present, that they had seen the Lord, that Christ had appeared uh, even though the doors were locked and the windows were shut and we were in our hideout, he knew where we are and where we were and he bypassed all of the barriers that we sought to keep unwelcome people out and all of a sudden he burst through our, 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 our barriers, busted down, you know, those obstacles that we tried to obstruct anyone from coming in and he appeared. By the way, let me just give you a little note of, of side application here. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter how many barriers or how many obstacles, how many excuses, how many things we try to do to protect and to preserve what we think we have to keep Jesus out. He can penetrate those barriers and those obstacles and he can invade our lives and appear present and speak into our hearts and our lives. We've seen the Lord. I mean, it's an exciting time. They saw the Lord. I imagine it taking a matter of a couple of seconds, maybe a couple of minutes, when all of a sudden we have seen the Lord. And then Thomas, notice his, his condition. He said, unless I see his hands, the mark of his nails, and the place of his finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. That's a condition that he places. I will not believe. Unless I see for myself and unless I touch. He kind of brings it up a notch. He wants the experience to be a little bit more than what the disciples experience. I want to touch. He's a, he's a feeler. He's a toucher. He's got to feel it. He's got to touch it. Verse 26. Eight days later, the disciples, his disciples were in sight again. And Thomas was with them. <laughs> Notice this is eight days later. And Thomas was there. Very clear, very specific. Thomas was present. I mean, I can imagine that those eight days were the longest days they had to wait for Christ to reappear. They were up in the room and they, many had seen him and Thomas had not. And Thomas was waiting for Christ to reappear. It took him eight days. 
Yeah, it's a subtle reminder to you and I, the fact and the reality is that uh, his timing is not our timing. His purpose is not our purpose. And what we want him to do, he does on his own time schedule in his own, in his own way. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for COVID-19 to end. But God is still working. And in his time and in his way, it will end. But not until he says it ends. And uh, so as a result of that, here we have this, this time of waiting. And we are waiting as they are waiting. And notice all of a sudden it's verse 26. And although the doors were locked, you know, I kind of wonder why the doors locked again. I mean, they know that Jesus is present and they should have placed their faith and trust in Christ and, and should not have been as afraid as they were before, but they're still there with their doors locked. And all of a sudden this supernatural presence of Christ shows up, even with the doors locked, Jesus came and he stood among them and said, same as he did before, peace be with you. Hey guys, you've been waiting more than eight days now. I just... You just want to be at peace. Remember my peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm present. And so in my presence, I want you to have the peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm going to bring everything down to, to my peace. In verse 27. And then he says to Thomas, notice what he says. Put your finger here and see my hands and put, your, and put out your hand and place it in my side. I don't know if it struck you or not, but Jesus wasn't present when uh, Thomas made this condition. In order for him to believe, how did Jesus know? You know, Jesus knew, even though he wasn't present. It's kind of interesting to me that no matter how many times I think I'm alone and what I do, I do, no one else can see, even when I travel back and forth from Montrose, because I don't get out of my truck, because I, uh, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to. So anyway, uh, he's still present with me. He still sees, he still knows, he still hears. And even though Jesus was not present with Thomas when he made this incredible condition that he was not going to believe absolutely emphatic, I will not believe unless I see, unless I touch, Jesus then extends to him this invitation. Thomas, I knew, I knew you before. I know what you said. And so I'm going to do what you're asking. He didn't have to do this. But he said, all right, Thomas, I'm going to meet your condition. But then Jesus said, do not disbelieve, but believe don't disbelieve. Don't disbelieve in the reality of my resurrection and the truth and the fact that I have conquered the grave and death. But believe, trust, put your confidence in me. Verse 28, Thomas answered him. How long do you think it took for this answer? I don't think it took very long. Milliseconds, if that's possible to even count. Notice what he says. It's not a, a subtle thing. My Lord and my God. It's a bold, it is a loud, it is a personal declaration. My Lord, my master, my sovereign, the one who is Lord of my life. It's a personal faith, a personal belief that Jesus Christ is not only Lord, but he is his deity. He is God manifesting himself in his presence. And because you are God, because you are deity, because you are supreme, I not only bow before you, I give my life unto you, and I am committed to you because you are my God and my Lord. Verse 29, Jesus responds to him. Notice the response. Have you believed because you have seen me? Seems like it's a question. And it is a question that Jesus is posing to Thomas, but it's more of a declaration of his faith. He's saying, Thomas, you have seen me. And now you believe. You believe me because you have seen me. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And here that's us today. We did not have and have not the privilege of seeing and being a part of this beautiful encounter with Christ, with the disciples in that hiding place and with Thomas today. And yet many of us today have seen the reality. We have seen the truth. We have put our faith and our trust, our confidence in Christ that he not only died on the cross for our sin, but he rose from the dead and that declaration that we once made. And I don't know when you made it, but I remember when I made it one day when I walked down an aisle at the church and took my dad's hand and told him that I want to place my faith, my trust, and my confidence in Jesus. He was the preacher at that day, uh, pastor of that church. And based upon my declaration of Jesus as my master and my Lord and now my God, that declaration was a life-changing experience that I will never outlive. And it's that declaration that's given me the life that I enjoy and know today. 
And so there was a life-changing declaration that he made and one that you and I must also make. If we are to have a life-changing transformation, the life change that his resurrection means for us today. And it brings us down to verse 30 and 31 as we conclude the gospel according to John. There is a life-changing decision that all of us must make as these disciples made in order to be able to enjoy what Jesus did on that first resurrection day. Notice verse 30. Now Jesus did, John says, records for us many other things, or signs, miraculous things, in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in these books. John said, you know, I, I didn't write them all down. Uh, that was one place I think in Scripture was said, if I were to write them all down, there wouldn't be a book big enough to contain all the things that Christ said and all the things that he did. But John doesn't want to be exhaustive. He thinks, I've done enough to record for you not only the the life and the ministry and the message of Christ but the miracle of His resurrection. I've written enough for you to be able to examine the evidence and see for yourselves the truth about who Jesus claimed to be and who He is today. Verse 31, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the Messiah. I've written these things down because I want you to not only read them and to see the truth for yourself as the disciples, but I want you, as you read them, to see for yourself the reality of the resurrection, of the power of that resurrection, and put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Christ, as your Messiah, as your Savior, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. That by believing you may have life in His name. Not just eternal life, but abundant life. For the life that Christ came to give us, by being raised from the dead, is not just about eternal life, but it's about abundant life. There's a beautiful passage that we see in John chapter 3, in the words of Jesus himself. It says, Jesus said, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, one and only son, for God so loved the world that He gave His one only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have an eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Christ came to save us from our sin against God, and that's why He died on the cross. But His resurrection in John 11, Jesus says in His own words, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in Him, Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Though he die, yet shall he live. And in the gospel according to Paul in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 9, it says, because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, in order for us to be saved from our sin, we must not only confess that Jesus is Lord, He is sovereign, He is God, but that He rose from the dead. You cannot, cannot be or call yourself a Christian without believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To put your faith and trust in Him, to believe in Him as not only your Lord, your sovereign, but that He is God. In fact, that He was raised from the dead and now He's seated at the right hand of the Father and one day, the trumpet of God will blow and the dead in Christ will rise and those of us who remain will be caught up together with Him in the clouds and will be forever with the Lord. It's not only about eternal life, but it's about abundant life. You can't know life in this life and life after this life through death without the resurrection of Christ and your belief in the power of that resurrection. I'm going to close with an interesting story of a little boy who was graduating from preschool and uh, it was a Christian school, and they were going to recite at this graduation celebration, the 23rd Psalm. And Joey's responsibility was to get up and stand in front of the, the audience and begin the psalm, and each child would say a, a sentence. And Johnny was the first, and they would rehearsed it several times, and Johnny had his line down, you know. And, uh, and so here we go with John, you know, and, and John with uh, Joey and, and, uh, and his, his ability to be able to say the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He said it many times and had it down. And uh, so uh, the, the day finally arrived for graduation. Well, Johnny had the, the right cue, stood up and got stage fright and uh, forgot his line. All he could say is, the Lord is my shepherd, 
and he froze. And his mother, who was sitting about two or three rows back, tried to yell, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He couldn't hear her, so he decided to start again. The Lord is my shepherd, and he froze. She said again, the line. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, and he froze. And she said again, the line. Finally, she said it loud enough so everybody in the auditorium could hear, and he kind of got that look on like, I got it now. And so he said very boldly and very with a whole lot of confidence, he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. Went back to the line. Of course, if you know anything about the 23rd Psalm, that is not the right part of the line. But even though it may not be the right part of the 23rd Psalm, it is a reality and a truth that I think helps us during this moment of celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Because He is our shepherd, because He is our Savior, who not only died on the cross for our sin, but rose again from the dead, from the grave, and that He is alive, we have no more fear. There's no more fear. There's no more fear in this life, and there's no more fear about the afterlife. For if we, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we have no more fear. We have an assurance. We have a guarantee. We have a confidence. We have a trust that Jesus as our Savior and our Lord removes fear in this life and in the life after. COVID-19 has brought a lot of fear in a lot of people's hearts and lives today. But when Christ is our Savior and our confidence and our faith and our trust is in Him, we have nothing to fear because He is the risen Lord, sovereign over today, tomorrow, and the afterlife. And our confidence and our trust is in Him. I hope today that if you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that you take this opportunity to put your trust, your faith, and your confidence in Him. If you've never made that decision, I'd like to invite you to do so today. Maybe another time, another place you've done that, but you've never publicly acknowledged that to anyone. Would you do it today? There's incredible confidence and faith and trust that comes when we proclaim or confess what we've done to other people. And uh, if you've done that, and you're a believer today, but you're living in fear and apprehension and concerns and all the worries that COVID-19 has brought into our lives and all the changes, I encourage you to put your faith and trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ who removes our fear, replaces it with faith, and it will change, it will transform how we live for Him through this crisis. Thank you for joining us today. Let me invite you, as you look on the screen, there's a place where you can connect with us. Uh, email us at celebrationmontrose at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you about any response or any decision, any commitment you've made in regard to this uh, broadcast today. Or maybe you'd like to call us at 970-497-4925. We'd love to have that call. Drew is just standing by the phone and he's waiting to receive your call uh, today. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. We'll see you next Sunday. Until then, put your faith and trust in God. Remember, He loves you. And so do we. God bless.